I sort of originally learned Marx through the lens of um, kind of the the whole world of philosophy influenced by Althusser and kind of French Marxism. Um, and instead of, basically instead of um, filtering it through any kind of uh, secondary literature or updates, I'm actually going to just kind of uh, try to speak in clear language about like the, the the overall shape of what uh what Marx was trying to do which is a bit more kind of imaginative and speculative than a lot of uh what more recent commentators or thinkers influenced by Marx uh say and it's it's kind of easier to understand i guess and i mean a key this is something that i think is uh not well understood in a way about marx is that he is really reiterating themes from traditional narrative onto theology um and uh this dimension this dimension of his work i think needs to be brought out um, and generally I would make the point that communism really would need to be a world of spiritually awakened quasi divine beings who are extremely intelligent and cosmopolitan. So here you, you, you could, you could say, and I'm saying here that there are kind of four key features of Marx's project. And one is his theory of dialectical materialism, which is the theory of history. Um, another is his uh, critique of ideology, not not even just the content of the critique, but sort of the the effort to to do a critique. Like what 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 is critique? How how is critique possible? And then there is the critique itself, not just of ideology, but of capital. And then there's the kind of vision of communism. So I'm just going to kind of go through each of these. Um, the basic idea of dialectical materialism is it's a theory of history. And the engine of history is the expansion of productive force. And productive force is human civilization's capacity to recreate itself. So it's like, uh, you know, it's, it's people making, it's people remaking the world, like literally making food that can be eaten and consuming it and, uh, uh, that, you know, shelter and that kind of thing. Like, right. So, so it's something very concrete, very actual. And I think this was, I think Marx kind of took pride in, in having something so actual be the core of his system. Um, uh, as, in, in contrast to sort of philosophical systems that start with something more abstract. So productive force expands. And what it means for productive force to expand is that it produces more, uh, it produces more efficiently, um, and there is greater connectivity between people, and the division of labor is more differentiated. And so the idea is that the productive force is expanding and that that is um, the engine of history. Now, there are um, stages
basically it's like as productive force is expanding a sort of collective world appears uh, that is kind of like a vessel for a certain limited range of productive forces expansion and um and it can sort of it fosters expansion up to a certain limit uh or like a sort of singular a, a, a threshold and then um once productive force has kind of outgrown that social form it 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 ruptures it and a revolution happens and then uh uh and some 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 sort of minor idea from the previous stage becomes a sort of major idea and and a new superstructure is created and what i mean by a social form is like basically it's like a social world of um legal relations social relations religious narratives um morality uh you know personal identity sort of sort of everything that's sort of important to people in the world constitutes a particular stage a mode of production and there's this, this key idea is that the content of that whole world is actually not true um it's its actual function is to uh, sort of subterraneanly serve the expansion of production and that the people who are living in this world don't realize that they think that they are um, um, that, that that their beliefs are real and and in fact there's this kind of function and and it will be discarded once it's uh, no longer needed so so there's this there's this false consciousness. And um, most of the stages actually, they, they, even though they're sort of a vessel for the expansion of productive force, they also have ideas in them that resist it expanding too far. And uh, capitalism is the, the current mode, and uh, it, it's, it's different for capitalism. Capitalism actually encourages... Uh, the expansion of productive force in a much more sort of direct and dynamic way. Um, but it's not unique in in terms of having a false ideology. Um, in, in, in other words, even though you can sort of see under the hood a little bit better under capitalism, you, we, we kind of understand that... Uh, that our culture, our, our social values are kind of, we, they, they, they could be discarded and that, and we sort we sort of know that the economy is kind of the, the main thing in the world or something. Um, there's still, there's still a huge amount of ideology and, um, and the, the nature of ideology has changed a lot since the time of Marx. But anyway, we're not really talking too much about specific theories of ideology. But so, um, anyway, that brings me to the sec second topic, which is critique of ideology. So, again, just very, very basic idea is that by, um, Marx believes that by examining capitalism, by like literally by examining theories of political economy, as well as sort of analyzing culture in other ways, you can find contradictions that if you're armed with this knowledge and you understand um, what these sort of false ideological claims are, um, it's possible to break free from ideology. And uh, with capitalism in particular, this involves a critique of the idea of freedom, that, that there's, this, uh, there's this widespread idea that we're free under capitalism, but that the concept of freedom doesn't apply to the capitalists and the proletariat in the same way, and it's, and it's a very sort of meager notion of freedom compared to the true freedom of which the human soul is capable.
capable. Um, and another aspect of um, breaking free is situating capital as a mode in the history of dialectical materialism. So to, to sort of understand that this isn't the way it has to be. And, and you do that by sort of writing a history where you show that it wasn't this way in earlier phases. But like, for example, people working for a wage or something. Um, now, here are some questions and kind of, I guess, kind of contradictions or like tensions. I mean, so I think maybe it's worth saying explicitly that Marx, Marx's the various aspects of his theory don't hang together very well, kind of famously. Like, he's not nearly as consistent of a thinker as, say, someone like Hegel or, like, like Aquinas. Or, you know, there, there, there are sort of systematic thinkers uh, who are, their systems are really internally consistent, and Marx tends not to be, which isn't necessarily a critique, um, or a, let's see, uh, 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 it isn't necessarily a flaw that like invalidates this whole project. And I'll get to that why in a second. But um, one question is that there seems to be a an initial contradiction between the theory of dialectical materialism and the idea that critique of ideology can help you to break free. Because what is this subject that is able to critique political economy. Um, it's so important to Marx that production comes first and that the whole constellation of ideas that constitutes culture is it's, it's, it's determined in the last instance by matter, by production. But if that's so, how is it, how is it possible that Marxist ideas are not also determined in the last instance by the expansion of productive force. And there's a number of ways you can answer that. Because, I mean, you could say, well, y yes, it ac actually it is determined in the last instance, and, and now productive force is uh, at a level where it needs a transition beyond capitalism, and that's what Marxism is. So you could make it consistent. Um, but this, this, this sort of leads to a whole question about teleology and fate and freedom and agency that um, uh, is a real kind of sticking point. And people kind of take sides, whether they're a teleological determinist, a vulgar Marxist, or whether it's... Anyway, so that's an issue. How does the idea of critique of ideology square with the theory of dialectical materialism? Another question is, um, where did this expanding productive force come from? Like, why why is this process happening? Why does productive force basically, you could say, go to all the trouble of creating con conscious human beings and tricking them so that they serve this process that they don't understand um and it can you can get you can you can get out you can try to get out of having to answer that question um really in two ways one is you know marx is at the end of the day a hegelian even though he's uh reacts against hegel in a lot of ways he's uh he's a hegelian in the sense that um, like Hegel, he asserts that truth is a process. And so um, even though there's this kind of metaphysical quality to um, this, you know, it, it, it's very much this kind of like Gnostic story of um, this kind of becoming that sort of surges through human history and, and there's an endpoint where we're sort of awakened. 
Um, the idea is that because you're sort of in media race creating this theory and it's sort of responding to this sort of history of critique that's already been going on, that um, that you don't need to start with first principles. of You don't need to say, well, you know, it's because of X that uh, that evil was born or something like that. There's also a, another reason that Marx could maybe claim that he can get out of needing to explain himself, which is more unique to Marx beyond Hegel, which is that there's this very major thesis that, th that the point of philosophy for Marx is to change the world, not necessarily to just understand it or explain it. Um, that, that, that philosophy is supposed to sort of perform something. Um, and again, uh, that isn't necessarily a fully watertight, uh, rejoinder or whatever, but, um, Nevertheless, it is fair to say that it's important to understand that there is there is this kind of logic that that these that that, that Marx and Hegel and a, a lot of these kind of German idealist thinkers, as well as existentialist uh, and post-structuralist thinkers, are tapping into that is neither teleological nor voluntaristic um, that you kind of have to just really dig into the meat of philosophy to kind of make contact with but it, it, it sort of involves like submitting to an alterity that 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 sort of like like be, being a vessel for new ideas sort of emerging and uh it's the, it's it's this it's it's the transcendental it's it, it's this realm that's sort of neither subject nor object um but anyway it's worth noting that this system really does uh draw a lot from um neoplatonism gnosticism kabbalah uh, Christian, you know, apocalyptic eschatology. Um, one particular idea from Kabbalah that really is taken up is this this idea that that at at the at the end of an historical process, um, there's kind of a birth of this kind of like perfect culture of awakened beings that that sort of understand. Um, now understand a process that humans didn't understand while civilization was going through it. And Mark, Marx tends to, you know, I mean, Marx is uh, part of this tradition of uh, these thinkers like Schelling and Fichte and uh, um, who, who are using these ideas much more explicitly and Marx kind of cuts you know, he, he, he kind of tries to bring it down to earth, but it's, it's still in there. Um, you might even say he's distorting it and, and it's actually misleading. Um, and then there's this other, just more, more in a way general or not more general, but just an, another theme that's very ancient is the idea that if that you can gain a certain true hidden knowledge about, reality which is the key to escaping fate and to sort of create a world that um is other than it would come out otherwise that's like that's like the philosopher's stone basically um so 
so so so keeping that in mind, you know that that that, that this has the sort of um, I don't know the kind of archetypal structure of um, with themes that really are come from various mystical um, theogonical narratives. Um, let's let's move on to j talk about just a little bit of the critique of capital itself, which has a lot of moving parts, but maybe if there's like one most important thing or maybe just one of the very important things is the, the idea that under capitalism, um, the increase of exchange value uh, explicitly rules the world um, more more than any political structure, more than social value, more than human life. Um, and there's this famous opposition between CMC, which is a commodity, money commodity, where use value is kind of the main, the main thing, um, the, the serving of people's needs, and money is used as exchange, um, as a sort of, that's the minor thing, and the major thing is, is sort of consumption and use. And now under capitalism, the main thing is exchange and um, that consumption and production happen for the sake of exchange and exchange because it's purely quantitative not qualitative the only way it can change is by increasing and so and so you uh, or by decreasing I guess but um, so there's there's that and then there's, you know there's all, all the stuff about sort of extracting surplus value from Basically, sur surplus value comes from a worker producing more value than the worker is paid for, and then there's more value in the system. Um, and uh, there's this other idea that the thought that we depend on the market rather than the other way around, that people tend to not see that... Uh, that humans are recreating human life, and we 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 sort of falsely uh, think that these abstractions, like price uh, and so forth, are real, and that we need to serve them, uh, but that in fact it's the other way around. Then there's the idea of the communist revolution. Um, and it's sort of a negative vision and a positive vision. So basically the idea is that with increased automation, the crises um, that capitalism will reach a point of crisis where demand can't keep up with production. And as, as val basically as production gets more automated and more efficient, the value of products goes down. And so things are less profitable, people are paid less, and things will get so bad for the proletariat that they will wake up and revolt, seize the means of production, and create a just society. And I think that's kind of more from his slightly later work. Um, and of course, he was writing before consumer culture and mass media and that kind of thing were really born. I think it's sort of widely, widely noted that maybe that would have happened, except that uh, consumer culture rose to the rescue, sort of, uh, to get people to consume more than they need to. Um, earlier, I think, in his... Uh, career, he also had a, a bit more of a teleological version of this that was less about revolt. And it was more this idea that with more and more technological sophistication, eventually it just won't be necessary for people to work. And, um, and there will be a society where free individuals can devote all their time to learning, creating, and growing. Um, and that that 
is kind of inevitable. Maybe it still takes something violent to kind of, uh, to kind of break out of the old mindset, but that, uh, that really capitalism does a lot of the work, uh, in terms of reaching a level of technological sophistication where, where this is possible. And there's this key point that I think is not noted often enough, which is that um, it's only the idea of leisure that was born through capitalism as something that is opposed to alienated labor that um, that makes it possible to even imagine this society of free individuals devoting their time to learning, creating, and growing as like something that would be desirable or that that is kind of thinkable as an ideal society um so so like the, because there's no there's no like transcendent value system like all all we can really conceive of is getting from capitalism to something that would be better than capitalism using the kind of um, measuring rod that is available to us in the present. Uh, so, so he really was not interested in like tearing the system down or going back to something else or that kind of thing. He re really saw this as a sort of transcend and include the way out is through kind of scenario. So I think um, maybe that's all I really have to say. Um, you know, I I think it's important to sort of hang on to hang on to this idea and then sort of reverse engineer politics from there. Like, I think maybe the key maybe the key in this is that. Typically, when people imagine communism, I think they are not imagining something quite as different from the way things are as Marx was imagining it. Like, the beings who would be joined together in communism are not necessarily us, um, in a way. You know, it's like, um, you know, and, and I think the the sort of progress of like the digital world and stuff really opens up that field and um and you can imagine it there's a lot of continuity between his vision of communism and the many visions of the kingdom of heaven that uh have been offered or channeled by theologians in the abrahamic tradition of um of like beings that that actually aren't even attached to matter anymore, um, and they live in a sort of imaginal realm, uh, or like their their sort of minds and emotions and perceptions, um, but they're just not afflicted by nature in the same way, and um, that could perhaps seem overly speculative or like at a far remove from concrete politics, but maybe it's the other way around. Maybe, maybe politics sort of needs um, big ideas to animate it and that this type of idea should really be kept in mind more. And then you sort of reverse engineer political ideals from, from this. So anyway, just some comments on Marx. Hope you enjoyed it.